afternoon, everybody. Um, I just wanted to welcome you to SPU 30, Life as a Planetary Phenomenon's kind of final section of the semester. Um, it's a two-hour uh, or twice-a-week lecture course offered by Professor Dimitar Sasilov here at Harvard. And once uh, a week, uh, the different section leaders who are graduate students and, and faculty and staff around Harvard uh, meet to kind of arrange in-depth conversations. Uh, the last section of the semester is offered to the students to visit many of the museums and lectures that are offered around to kind of get them an intimate experience. So for instance, we talk about meteorites and hopefully some of them go to the, the, American, the Museum of Natural History and see the ones that are on display there. Um, every, for the past two years, I've asked Professor Gingrich to come and give a talk on something historical that relates something we've talked about in class to uh, something at the observatory here or something that we've kind of grown up with. Um, this year, I was reading um, Harlow Shapley's Beyond the Observatory. I picked it up at a, an amateur astronomy convention. And I was shocked to read in parts of this that he described discovering the origin of life in 1967. And that boggled my mind that the same conversations which I had at group lunch with Dimitar were the same conversations that we were having in class. And how could 50 years ago Shapley been talking almost word for word exactly what we're doing today? Um, and I guess the timing of this talk is even better because if those of you, one other uh, activity for Section 10 is to watch Cosmos. And for those of you who potentially watched it, Sunday night Neil Tyson talked for the first 20 minutes about the women computers here at the observatory. Um, Annie Cannon, most specifically, and Cecilia Payne. Annie Cannon, for those of you who don't know who she is, is the woman who first uh, looked at uh, the spectra plates or the spectra of the stars is when you put light through a prism and you get the, the rainbow out and the different types of absorption and emission lines that we've talked about in class and classified them in terms of their temperatures and, and different scales. Um, this later led to what Neil Tyson calls the most influential and the gold standard for theses in the field of astronomy, Cecilia Paynes. This is the first woman who got her PhD in astronomy here at the observatory. Um, interestingly enough, at the very end of Cosmos, uh, or at the very end of that segment, uh, Neil talks about uh, Cecilia's interactions with Henry Norris Russell at Princeton and talking about how she discouraged him from writing the, the conclusions that the, cor that the outer corona of the sun was made out of hydrogen. And it's, it kind of had this handwritten scrawled note being like, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I have found, somewhat similar to the way Copernicus, I think, talked about his discoveries. But I'm sure Owen will correct me on that. Turns out that there's no handwritten uh, notes at the, end, at, the end of her, at the end of her thesis. Um, and a very kindly Chris Erdman from the library found and, and has brought the original copy. So for those of you that are interested, we'll have that on display afterwards. So uh, the reason that, we've, that I asked Owen to give this talk about Harlow Shapley, as I said, is that towards the end of his tenure here, after being the fifth director, he discussed basically exactly what, I'm, what I've been doing research on, what Dimitar and what other members of the, the astronomy department and biology department are talking about. And uh, I know it, it, it may take a, a moment, but I wanted to read you the foreword from, from this book. Um, so uh, it's, it's titled Beyond the Observatory. These informal essays, several of them developed from talks I have given over the past few years, deal with a variety of topics, more of them in the realm of practical sociology than that of astronomy, and with much more intermingling of disciplines. For if we would contemplate the colossal galaxies, we must first approach, by way of wavelengths, the minutest of measured things. And if we would contemplate the neutrinos, we should give thought to the endless space-time worlds in which such elementary particles are embedded. Among these essays, some are dominant, dominated by biology. They are Life and Hope in the Psychozoic Era, Apologies to a Comet, The Five Beasts of My Own Apocalypse, some are astronomical, Life Among the Dwarfs, 30 Deductions from the Glimmer of a Star. The remainder are in the categories of general and social sciences. The, there is in the essay some repetition, not of plain statements, but of argument. For example, in two essays, Breathing the Future and the Past, and Six Notes of the Planets in Life, I discuss the atomic element argon, once to relate it to the evolution of the elements and to emphasize the sociology of the many species of atoms. We may look with amazement, in fact, with pride, at the list of 10 revelations in the first essay. Have we come to the end of sensational developments that have done so much to orient man's thinking and doing? Most certainly not. Tremendous achievements have already been made in space exploration, and I would expect and I would be inclined to predict even bigger and faster equipment and exploitation of space in further ways and new and, new and strange ways. 
In the field of cosmography, what Owen will be talking about, what about the recently discovered quasars and other queer objects that seem to be millions of times bigger than stars and a billion times brighter? There is something mysterious here that transcends the present theories about galaxies and their spaces. By way of some new kind of chemistry, the mysteries of the origins of life may be solved in the near future. There, there are, I believe, scientific discoveries just ahead that will help revise our knowledge of space, time, and matter. It is indeed a grand time to be alive and asking questions. And that last line, I think, is the reason why I really read that to you, because that is exactly the same type of thing which I tell my students to come to my section every week, that we're in this really cool era of new discoveries every week with new planets from Kepler. Or um, a, a month ago, we had the discovery about seeing the gravitational waves from the earliest parts of, of the cosmos. And so I wanted to relate that a little bit to us here at Harvard and, and some of the discoveries. And so with that, I think I'll turn it over to Professor Gingrich to talk about Harlow Shapley, cosmographer. I'm going to start not at the end of Shapley's career, nor at the beginning, but somewhere in between. And I've brought along an original telegram in the old days when they would actually send this out in paper. It's from Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. Dr. Harlow Shapley, Harvard College Observatory. Distinguished colleagues of yours have suggested you might be willing to come to testify for defense at Dayton, Tennessee next week in the case of State of Tennessee versus Professor Scopes. We of the defense would be delighted to add you, your authority to our position. Your expenses will be paid. Will you wire me directly at Dayton and I will let you know on which day you will be needed. Signed, Clarence. How many of you know who Clarence was? <laughs> Shout it out. Clarence Darrow. Clarence Darrow. Okay, so that's the telegram, and I'm going to pass it around in the hopes that I'll get it back. <laughs> the mystery is, how was an observatory director here in Cambridge sufficiently well known that uh, he would have this kind of an invitation to go down. And I should add immediately that he was on his way to an IAU, International Astronomical Union meeting in Paris, and uh, or someplace, maybe Cambridge, England. In any event, he was going off to Europe, and he did not go uh, to Dayton for that. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background of this uh, Missouri-born twin, not, uh, not a, an identical twin. His brother was content to be a farmer and finally finished his college education when he was in his 80s, I believe. But uh, uh, he uh, did not get a standard sort of education. Uh, he was, did not quite finish high school till somebody said, young man, you know, you ought to, ought to go to school some more. So he did, and he went to, uh, uh, through high school very quickly in the hopes of going to the University of Missouri because he heard they were introducing uh, a program in journalism there. And he had been working as a reporter on several newspapers in Kansas and in Arkansas. So, uh, he went there, and he was uh, always sort of a joker, and he says in his book that uh, he was disappointed to learn that the School of Journalism wasn't yet open, and he had to do something else. So he looked in the catalog, and the first thing was A-R-C-H-E-O-L. He couldn't pronounce that, so he went on to the next one, uh, which was astronomy. And he decided, OK, he'll do astronomy. <laughs> he, he did astronomy pretty well there. Uh, Professor Sears saw that he had unusual talent and suggested that he might apply to Princeton, where Henry Norris Russell, who became one of the leading astrophysicists of the early part of the 20th century, 
was looking around for the possibility of a graduate student or so. So he got a, a special scholarship to go there, and uh, he worked very industriously, getting something like 10,000 observations of uh, binary stars, and then worked with Russell in order to get the orbits of these. He got the orbits of 100 eclipsing binaries, which was quite remarkable considering that fewer than 10 had been done previously. So this was a massive uh, sort of work. Then what to do? Well, Sears, his professor in Missouri, had meanwhile gone out to work with George Ellery Hale at the Mount Wilson Observatory. And Sears said there is a possibility of a job out at Mount Wilson. So why don't you apply to that? And Hale is coming uh, east. And if you go to see him in New York uh, for breakfast, he'll have a chance to interview you. So Shapley went. He went early. He went the night before and went to an opera uh, just to make sure he would be there in time for breakfast with George Ellery Hale. Hale uh, then uh, asked him all about the opera. And they had great conversation on such matters, whereas Shapley was just dying to tell Hale all about Cepheid variable stars. And, there, and just when he thought he had his chance, Hale said, well, I've got to leave. I'm traveling, and jumped up. And uh, uh, you can imagine Shapley trailing him down the sidewalk trying to tell him about eclipsing binary stars and the fact that Cepheid variable stars were not eclipsing binaries because when he tried to do the solution he found that one star had to be inside the other and that didn't work. Uh, and Sears, who was there too, kept saying, it's all right, don't worry, it's all right. Shapley said later that he finally understood it after some years. Hale knew as much about his work on eclipsing binary stars as he needed to know, but Hale was interested to know if he could talk about anything else, because there would be long nights up on the mountain, and uh, the question is, could he have conversations with the other observers up there? And Shapley said it was an important lesson to learn. He used it many times later when interviewing people uh, for, for jobs. Well, there at Mount Wilson, he had access to the 60-inch telescope. And he immediately started in working on questions of Cepheid variable stars, making a huge number of observations, and working very hard, and churning out papers so rapidly that uh, they were not all published in the astrophysical journal, but some of them with astrophysical journal formats were included in contributions from the Mount Wilson Observatory, a publication that you may imagine just duplicated the astrophysical journal. Uh-uh, not always. He wrote a letter in, uh, uh, to Cap Tyne, who had been a regular visitor at Mount Wilson, that the work on clusters goes on monotonously. Monotonous so far as labor is concerned, but the results are continual pleasure. Give me enough time and I shall get something out of the problem yet. That was in 1917. Just a year later, he wrote uh, a letter to Eddington over in Cambridge, England. I've had in mind from the first that results more important to the problem of the galactic system than to any other question might be contributed by the cluster studies. Now, with startling suddenness and definiteness, they seem to have elucidated the whole sidereal structure. And he explained in the letter how the luminosity period law of Cepheid variation, which had something that had been found here, is now pretty uh, pr prettily defined. It is based on 230 stars with periods ranging from 100 days to 5 hours, so on. He was able to get the distances of the globular clusters. There were approximately 100 of them known. He 
realized getting these distances which were larger than anything that had been uh, found or discussed by astronomy up to that point uh, seemed to center in the direction of Sagittarius and Scorpius at a substantial distance away. And that meant that rather than the Sun being the center of our Milky Way galaxy, there was some distant center and this enlarged the scope of the astronomical setting uh, enormously. He wrote a letter to Hale. Hale was a, a very nervous man and had periodic mental breakdowns and was off in the hospital. So Shapley wrote him a letter saying that uh, he was glad to hear that uh, uh, Hale was feeling better and so on and he says that uh, maybe this uh, will not uh, disturb you too much to divert your attention from earthly troubles to heavenly affairs <laughs> and he says the first man on earth away back in the later Pliocene who knocked out a hairy elephant with his club or saw his pretty reflection or received a compliment became suddenly conceited. It was a mutation. And there immediately evolved the first reflective thought in the world. It was, I am the center of the universe. Thereupon he took himself a wife, transmitted this bigotry of his germ plasm, and through hundreds of thousands of years the same thought without much alteration has been our heritage. In later years, however, the thought has been held in all strictness and confidence only by very conceited fools and philosophers, and the latter have generally modified it to, I am the universe, or perhaps by Jove only half of it. Less conceited fools decided that some locality might be the center, the Upper Nile, the Garden of Eden, Athens, Rome, Potsdam, Pasadena, or whatever geographical spot was the center of their thought and so on. The letter goes on for three pages. I'm not going to read it all to you, but you can see that even at that early stage, uh, Shapley was something of an essayist and uh, was uh, willing to speculate on these kinds of things. Now, around that time, word came that Professor Pickering, the director of the Harvard Observatory, had died. And Shapley had to ask himself, should I try out to be his successor? If I would go to Harvard, Shapley thought, they have a 60-inch telescope, which they're not using very much. It was mounted down the hill now where the gymnasium is. Uh, that with that, they also have the possibility of a telescope of that size in the southern hemisphere. And in the southern hemisphere, you can study the uh, Magellanic clouds with a 60 inch telescope as effectively as on Mount Wilson with a 100 inch telescope by that time, you could be examining the Andromeda Nebula. So he figured he, if he would come here, he could still be in the big league in terms of studies of, uh, of these nebulae. It was not yet known how distant they were and so on. So he thought about it and he worked, he got a great letter of recommendation from Cap Tyne, who is a very distinguished Dutch astronomer who was working with a universe that was basically heliocentric rather than galactocentric. Uh, but uh, uh, Cap Tyne gave a very generous uh, letter of recommendation for him and the university decided they will, would check out this uh, relatively young man. He was in his uh, early 30s at that time. Uh, so they, they sent out their spies. This was the one time when Harvard was actually playing in the Rose Bowl game. 
and uh, Shapley and his wife had tickets to go with two of the Harvard representatives. He said they were sent out to see if his wife and he had proper manners to be able to come here. Uh, and then he had a special opportunity. They were looking for some sort of a uh, evening entertainment, a conversazione, at the National Academy of Sciences meeting in Washington, D.C. And the person running it just could not bear the thought that somebody might want to talk about relativity. And Hale had a, another proposal. Uh, he could have Shapley come out and speak uh, with uh, somebody else who, from uh, Curtis, from Lick Observatory, who was talking about these spiral nebulae as very distant universes, using novae that were found in them to estimate their distance. But he didn't agree at all with Shapley's calibration of the Cepheid curve and the distances he was getting uh, for uh, the globular clusters. So it made for possibly a great debate. And so there they were. Shapley was given $100 to pay for the train, the hotel, the lodging, everything. Generous amount in those days. And he came, but he was really uh, at the short end of the deal because Curtis was a very accomplished lecturer. He had gone to any number of men's clubs and give a nice presentation and Shapley was not at all prepared <clears throat> in this way. So Harvard of course sent their spies down to the meeting and the postcard or message that came back to uh, President Lowell was that he does not seem to be a big enough man for the job. So uh, this really uh, got the process all stalled because Harvard didn't know what to do. So they offered the position to Henry Norris Russell, who thought about it a while and then decided he didn't want to leave Princeton because he didn't want to do administrative work and that uh, he'd rather stay put. So that left Harvard kind of stuck and uh, Hale understood this so Hale made a suggestion to uh, President Lowell he said I'll give Shapley a leave of absence and I'm raising his salary so it matches what you are offering him so that that will not be a consideration and you can try him out and so in uh, the spring of 1921, Shapley arrived here and uh, then in due time in November or late October, Hale wrote to President Lowell and said, we're working on our budget for next year and we need to know if Shapley's coming back. And uh, the response from uh, President Lowell was, what a coincidence, your letter just arrived this morning and at the same time we were just appointing Shapley director of the observatory. I forgot to say that Shapley came out as the senior scientist but he was not appointed director, he was just on a trial. And one of my friends read my paper based on the material in the archives and he said, but but how did he change so quickly to be a big enough man for the job? And I thought about it and I realized that the secret lies with a scrapbook which is in the archives with the Shapley papers. And this is what you would call in journalism a string book. It had pasted in it all of the articles about the Harvard Observatory that appeared in the local newspapers. Shapley having been a reporter himself, understood how to work it on, uh, for journalists. And he was turning out these articles about what a terrific place Harvard Observatory was and so how many things were going on here. And that won the day. I've brought along a little book here called The Universe of Stars, uh, which was published in 1926 
and these are all radio talks. Now that was in the early days of radio, and to have these uh, half-hour talks uh, was uh, quite extraordinary. And then putting them here uh, is is also uh, quite remarkable. It's by a whole bunch of different people, and among them is uh, uh, Cecilia Payne, uh, who is saying that uh, uh, it's on the, what the stuff stars are made of. And it is the most important uh, theme in her thesis, which is that all that despite the great differences of the spectra, if you take into account the temperature and pressure and so on, it turns out that all these different looking spectra are just the effects of temperature uh, as to which atoms you see. And so she says, but we can say pretty definitely that the seven commonest elements of which the Earth is made are oxygen, iron, silicon, magnesium, aluminum, calcium, and sodium. We have reasons for thinking that the eight commonest elements on the stars are probably oxygen, silicon, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, calcium, iron, and carbon, exactly the same as for the Earth. You're asking where's hydrogen? No, hydrogen seemed to be too peculiar. The reason that her thesis is call, was called by Otto Struve many years later as the most important uh, uh, thesis in astronomy ever written was because of her conclusion that all the stars had the same composition and had nothing whatsoever to do with hydrogen. Just wanted you to have that straight in case you were looking at the Cosmos program on uh, Sunday <laughs> night. <laughs> Anyway, what do we find uh, at the end? Chapley's own contribution. Life in other worlds, question mark. The frequent suggestion that we might exchange signals with organisms on Mars is, I think, extremely preposterous. <laughs> so anyway, he was thinking about those questions even back in the 1920s. At the end of that period, well, anyway, this was still just, let me see, the date on this is 1926, and that telegram is 1925. So he already had a reputation as a speaker and as a source of great things coming out of Harvard Observatory, uh, even even before that time, but it was part of his growing reputation. In 1930, he did another book. This is called Flights from Chaos, and this is a genuine cosmography because he starts out with the tiniest of atoms and he works his way up through a scale all the way up to a super galaxy. It is a mapping a graphing of the cosmos. And it, it was widely read. When I first came here as a graduate student, you could find this all over in used bookstores. Obviously, it had a, a, a big uh, uh, press run and was uh, uh, very widely used. So these things helped in giving him uh, a, a reputation as far as the New York Times index was concerned, uh, there are more references to Shapley than any other scientist excepting Einstein. So I thought I would give you a little vignette of uh, Shapley and Einstein. In 1936, the university celebrated its tercentenary and they decided they would be giving honorary degrees to the most illustrious people all around the world. And of course, Einstein's name came up as a possibility. And it was felt that this would, be, would not do. Uh, 
because if they invited Shapley for an honorary degree, uh, I, if they invited Einstein for an honorary degree, uh, then uh, he would steal the show. So Shapley's idea was, well, they should give him an honorary degree in 1935. Uh, then, uh, uh, the question was how to get Einstein to come because he was very reluctant about things like that and Shapley had an idea and that was he would uh, suggest that Einstein could stay here at the residence and he should bring along his violin and that they would have some first-rate musicians join in for some chamber music and this really did happen because we have the photographs of Einstein coming up the drive with his violin case in hand. And they had some, some chamber music here and Einstein happily got the degree. Then 1936 rolled around. Did they play the, did they have the music here? Yes. Aren't you going to tell the, the punchline? <laughs> <laughs> you mean the professional musicians who played with him said Einstein had three tempi, slow, slower, and slowest. <laughs> anyway, the next, the next year, then people began to get nervous about it. Well, maybe with all these distinguished people, Sigmund Freud and all the rest, uh, coming here for uh, honorary degree maybe he would feel left out. So as Shapley told it to me, uh, he, he went back to uh, upstate New York where Einstein was summering to talk it over with him about whether he would feel left out. But on the other hand, uh, I just noticed I have a Xerox of a letter that Einstein wrote to Mrs. Shapley saying that no, he didn't really think he needed another degree. Uh, so I suspect that maybe this was handled by correspondence rather than Shapley making a trip out there. You can never be quite sure about these things because in his book, uh, his autobiography, uh, Shapley has an interesting story about when he was in Washington for that debate with Curtis that there was also a big dinner and that Einstein was there, seated on the platform between some other foreign celebrity. And they, the Academy was busy giving prizes to somebody who was a great expert on hookworm. And the person in question was speaking at interminably. And uh, Shapley and others in the audience saw Einstein lean over to say something to the person sitting next to him who could hardly conceal that he was almost doubling up in laughter. And so afterwards, everybody went to say, what did Einstein say? Einstein said, this is giving me a new view of eternity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am not going to tell you what Chapley did while he was director. Uh, he did a lot of uh, work on the, on the plates uh, with the assistants uh, to uh, look at the uh, structuring of the arrangement of galaxies in space. And he really was the first person who came along with the idea that the galaxies were not distributed uniformly, but there were great uh, sections of clustering going on. So uh, he had, uh, they had lots of plates. Uh, this building was built in 1930, I think, 31, okay, uh, for uh, giving more space for the glass plates. Uh, which had outgrown Building C over there on the other side. Uh, and these plates were being used for all sorts of things. I've brought a plate along, or uh, David has brought one along, uh, because this plate in particular uh, is uh, the one that uh, is mentioned in Flights from Chaos. Uh, 
this one is mentioned specifically uh, because it has some interesting things on it. It has here the planet Saturn, which is unusual, and down here is one of the first asteroids to be found uh, in the 19th century named Iris, and if you look at the plate very carefully, you'll see that it has a little streak because it actually moved during the long exposure of this plate. But there's something else up here with the arrow on it marking something, which is hard to see in there, but in that little circle is a satellite of Saturn, Phoebe, and this was the discovery plate for that particular satellite of Saturn. Uh, oh, what's the date of the plate? 1898. 1898, so it's one of these large plates of which there is a monumental collection uh, on the other side of the hall. So uh, it was interesting that Chapley disgu discusses in the opening chapter of this book what is can be seen on this. You sitting in, even in the first rows can probably not see the fact that there are some thousands of stars on that plate. For those of you who are interested, you can come up and check it out after the talk. Okay. So, working on the, uh, on the galaxy clustering was one of the important things he did, but probably equally important was founding the graduate school of astronomy here. And there was a time when the majority of observatory directors in the major observatories in the country were Harvard graduates uh, from, from the graduate school. Uh, he also uh, brought a large number, well not a large number, but a, a critical number of people uh, from Europe and from other places in the United States uh, to have a technical summer school here in the late 30s. Uh, people who, from Europe who, for example, because of the turmoil in Europe were refugees, came and spoke here. Uh, and uh, this was very important in introducing physics into astronomy because of the people that Chapley brought. And they came to this particular room. This, this is a room that has Shapley's uh, sense of how to do things. For example, around the top you can see the symbols for the zodiacal signs and in the back for the planets. And this was, the planet Pluto had just been uh, discovered. It was thought in those days to be a planet. Uh, <laughs> And he needed a symbol for it. So there you can see the PL put together, standing for Percival Lowell or for Pluto. He had to sort of single-handedly coerce the uh, people uh, involved to get a symbol made so they could complete the balcony uh, uh, railing. Anyway. There wasn't an International Astronomical Union meeting for four years in that time, and uh, so uh, it was not done by the Union, but separately. After Shapley retired in 1951, uh, it then, he then started putting a lot of his essays together in a series of books. Uh, I've looked in the archives and there are a huge number of talks that Chapley gave. He apparently did not repeat himself that much, but typically would invent a new talk when he had a new invitation. So there are a huge number of unpublished essays, but he kept putting some of them together in book form as he began thinking about these cosmographic ideas. When I first came here, I came as a summer assistant for him, and uh, he was then for the first time teaching a course uh, 
at the uh, university, an undergraduate course uh, in cosmography, as he called it. It was the same kind of idea that was already there in 1930 in his Flights from Chaos. Uh, and then, as he kept thinking about these topics, of which Life on Other Worlds was a typical one, he wrote essays that touched on it. And so I thought I would, uh, let's see what I have marked here. He has, a, he has an interesting sort of vocabulary, uh, interesting lilt to his writing. He, uh, there, there's a certain sort of, of humor in it. Uh, also, though, uh, uh, a certain amount of wanting to people, people to know that he was the person who made the universe so much bigger. Uh, the life we know... Uh, he was making the Milky Way enormously bigger at the, in having the dimensions there in uh, 1919. It was an enormous leap. Shapley himself estimated the distance to uh, the Andromeda Nebula as uh, a million light years, but he backed off of that uh, later but he was there thinking about those problems, of course. The island universe became much bigger, but he uh, didn't want people to forget that he had made this first big step. The, the lot... Of stars and men. Human response to an expanding universe. The life we know and which we have loosely defined on earlier pages is essentially that which, in our mixture of precocious grasp and profound ignorance, we would recognize and designate as life on the surface of any planet we should visit. The idea of the precocious grasp and profound ignorance, uh, an interesting pattern of the language. When I picked up this book for myself, I was astonished to find that the back of it was all tremendously marked up. And it turns out this was his uh, working copy of making yet another essay, which appears in the next book, called a view f The View from a Distant Star. And so I just thought I would uh, read a few of these little places uh, which have to do with uh, the possibilities of life on other worlds. In the study of biological evolution, several important advances have recently been made in the fields of photosynthetic research, virology, microbiology, and chemi chemical biogenesis. From these researches, it now seems clear that the origin of life, however life is defined, is an inevitable step in the gas and liquid evolution on a star illuminated planet's surface when the chemical, physical, and climatic conditions are right and the range of rightness can be wide with considerable tolerance in temperatures, atmospheric pressures, and chemical composition of air and water. So there he, there he is making an interesting philosophical statement that life can be expected just more or less automatically. This is a philosophical statement, Erwin. <laughs> <laughs> As to the human organism existing elsewhere, I take a dim view. Exact duplication of Homo sapiens on another planet is a very long shot even in this chance-rich universe of stars, space, time, and energy. There are more than a million known variations on the animal theme. Innumerable species of plants and animals have long thrived, but eventually failed to survive environmental hazards, and so on. So he, he repeats the idea that it's going to be tough to find 
organisms that you can talk to on other planets. But re we must remember there are millions of variations on the plant and animal themes. Hence, a belief in the exact duplication anywhere of Homo sapiens is not very sapient. <laughs> <clears throat> and let's see if I can figure out why I've put the marker here. I'll skip that and go to the end of this book, The View of a, from a Distant Star. And it is one of his uh, most important essays, because this one was reprinted in a number of, of sources. And it's entitled, A Design for Fighting. I shall begin by recounting a sad folk tale. Once upon a time, but recently, there was a great nation in a mess. When it struggled to disentangle itself from the condition that had been brought on by this and that, the situation seemed to grow messier, and no less than 22 millions of its adults voted to change horses in the middle of the bog. That nation's ills were everywhere obvious. A great many poor people were hungry, while other citizens destroyed their surpluses. More than 10 million were unemployed, and the desires of laborers for greater pay and prestige were doing badly. The women without higher education were submerged by custom and lack of opportunity. The people had no thrifty desires to accumulate savings, and indeed they had nothing much to save. The young men and women had little systematic training in health or in patriotism, and they had little opportunity to travel. You have guessed the nation's name. In this economically and spiritually confused country, we continue to list its ills, diseases like measles, pneumonia, and syphilis were badly controlled, if at all. Mosquitoes and flies seemed destined to be eternal pests and carriers of disease. Practically no one in all that nation could use radar or anti-radar or anti-anti-radar. Social reforms were progressing with difficulty, and the educational policy was static. He gives a somber account of the 1930s in America. And then he said he has a chapter or a section of it, a suggested therapy for hard times. If I had at that time ventured to suggest that the affi afflicted nation could remedy all these ills, every one of them, by entering into the greatest and bloodiest human war ever conceived, take part in a war that would destroy more property and brutally butcher more innocent people than the worst human bu but bu butchers had ever enjoined in their goriest dreams, if I had recommended that mad procedure, guaranteeing the almost complete cure of the enumerated ills within 10 years, and guaranteeing the practical attainment of all the high goals I have implied, it's quite likely that both my advice and I would have been deplored. But he goes on to say that that is exactly what World War II accomplished in providing employment and all of the rest of those things that were ailing in the 1930s. He said that is not the way to go. But there are battles to be fought. And so he selects enemies for the coming wars. Illiteracy, premature senility, cultural uniformity, the tyranny of the unknown. It is a very thoughtful and a very interesting essay which comes as the climax of this book. Well, I wanted to tell you about Chapley because he was uh, somebody who understood how to use the press and how to write interesting essays. He did not have the same kinds of media outlets that Carl Sagan had, 
but in some ways uh, he was uh, that kind of public figure in his day, uh, becoming uh, very famous, very well known. Uh, when he was called in to the House Un-American Activities Committee, the newspaper in Boston simply, the big headline said, Shapley defies Rankin. Everybody knew who Shapley was. Nobody knew who Rankin was? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we've forgotten. <laughs> I turn it over now to David, and you may have questions. Why don't we thank Professor Gingrich? Well, I hope that most of you can understand why I invite Professor Gingrich to talk about some of the, to reiterate some of the things we talk about in class in a historical point of view. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, on the Curtis Shapley debate where he came out on the short end, uh, is it true, I mean, I read this once, I don't know if it's true, that he really believed that this wire parallax that Van Manen had measured showed that Andromeda was moving on the sky. Is that, did that really motivate him to, you know, think that Andromeda was really inside the Milky Way? Uh, yes. Uh, this was one of the important arguments that Chapley had. Uh, Van Manen was very good at precise measuring. He was on the staff at Mount Wilson Observatory. He measured on a certain number of spiral galaxies that they were rotating and that if they were rotating and were as far away as Curtis said, they would be going at a dizzying speed. Uh, it is still not known exactly why Van Manen went wrong, uh, but he uh, did. The plates were remeasured uh, by Hubble and Vada, and uh, they couldn't get the same results. But it was one, one of several things that uh, kept Chapley from accepting, in the first instance, the, the distance there. At the same time, you have to understand that uh, uh, as far as Curtis was concerned, there was no such thing as a period luminosity law. He plotted data by using Cepheids that were uh, too far away to have good data on their uh, luminosities and showed essentially a scatter diagram. So uh, you have to understand that uh, uh, there were errors on both sides of that debate. Uh, quickly, just, just to let you guys know, Erwin Shapiro, who was the last director of the CFA, is one of the people who's been attending our talk in the long lineage of wonderful directors. But uh, Tim Attar. Well, uh, our, thank you for a great talk. Uh, our students know that we, we offer a lot of opportunities uh, for undergraduates here at the observatory, but what was the situation back then? Maybe at least the time when you came to work for Shepley. I uh, missed He didn't teach very much, so would there a lot of undergraduate students coming from uh, uh, the college, Harvard College, here at the observatory? Uh, uh, very little. In, in the pre-Shapley days, there was uh, no education program here. Uh, the uh, astronomy professor uh, who taught, taught at the astronomy laboratory which was down in the yard where the graduate uh, uh, school buildings are now. Uh, there's where people would go for the uh, navigation course or the introductory astronomy course and so on. But the seniors were on a special occasion allowed to march from the yard in pairs up to the observatory, up the observatory <laughs> hill to see the great telescope. And I suppose probably to look through it because in those days it was available that way. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, I have a, an image of it. I've never seen a picture of it, of course. But uh, so it was, it was different for uh, when Shapley came and there came a cadre of graduate students here. But, uh, and there were a certain number of very good undergraduates who managed to have office space up here and were taking some of the advanced courses. Uh, but there was no uh, large scale uh, 
undergraduate attendance here. The, cor the astronomy courses then, which were open to undergraduates as well, were taught down at, 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 in the Radcliffe Yard in Byerley Hall. I was just wondering how popular Shapley's books were. Do we have any information on their sales? Some of them went into other editions. One of them was even made into a film. Uh, I actually have the VHS tape. I can't find a VHS player that I can play it on. It both sound <laughs> but I, didn't, I was able to find it. It does exist. I think the, they, they would not have been one every three or four years if they didn't sell. Although each one is from a different publisher. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, articles are, the essays are interesting to read. There, there, he mentions the question of, of argon a number of times. So that every breath you take, you are sharing argon atoms with the dying breath of Cleopatra. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Could you just elaborate about Henry Norris Russell and Cecilia's thesis? Because I, I recall the story where he made her recant or change something about the last sins. That's where I thought it was hydrogen and helium, but I'm clearly confused about that. No, hydrogen and helium. The calculations that she made uh, were uh, indicated a huge abundance of hydrogen. That's what I thought. And uh, Henry Norris Russell was her de facto thesis advisor, right. even though he was down in Princeton. Uh, and Shapley was nominally the advisor. But everybody was convinced that iron was the most abundant element. The reason being that one, Iron is tremendously abundant in the core of the Earth. Meteorites coming in are iron. You look at the solar spectrum, there's more iron lines than anything else. Uh, so this was just the, the standard doctrine. And so essentially, uh, Russell said that uh, all the evidence suggests that there cannot be this huge abundance of helium that was being seen. Sorry, yeah. both. Helium and hydrogen. Uh, there had to be something astrophysically wrong with those atoms. She was using a, uh, an untested technique to try to estimate the abundances. It turned out to be an okay technique that was right, but at the time there was no backup for it to see. And it wasn't until uh, Menzel, working out at Lick Observatory, uh, began to uh, see w with the, uh, some of the solar results, uh, led to the same conclusion. And that persuaded Russell that after all, maybe this, this made sense. But in any event, it was seen that the hydrogen abundance could just be a surface phenomenon, that somehow the lightest material rose to the top. It wasn't until 1932 when uh, Strumgren and Eddington uh, did the stellar interior, interior models, which showed that it could be hydrogen all the way to the middle. And that was the great uh, breakthrough that made, that made it an acceptable idea. But when uh, Otto Struve called her thesis the uh, greatest thesis written in astronomy, it is in the context of the fact that the star compositions were essentially the same. There's nothing mentioned about hydrogen at all in that part of his book. But I thought that's because Russell told her to take it out, that she'd written her thesis saying, yes, there's all this hydrogen, and he looked at her thesis and said, no way, and take that out. And there, was di there was discussion of, of preliminary drafts, but in the printed version, uh, it doesn't show, other than, other than the mention that it seemed 
there seemed to be something wrong with hydrogen. This is coming up because this was a major point in Cosmos two nights ago. Yeah. So why don't we thank Owen one more time. Mm -hmm.